Welcome to Healing and Made Free with Janet Boynes Ministries. Thank you for listening. Janet will be talking about her struggle with addiction, alcohol, drugs, eating disorders, unwanted same-sex attraction, and living a homosexual life. Janet has survived all those things by the grace of God. Janet's not a doctor. She's not a therapist. She's not a psychotherapist. She's not a licensed counselor. Janet is an ordained pastor and wants to show you God's promises, how God has set her free, and how you can be set free. What he has done for her, he will do it for you. If healing and freedom are what you want, you have come to the right place at the right time. Let's get started. Here is Janet Boynes. I have the founder and chairman of Liberty Council, my friend, Matt Staver. Welcome, Matt. Good to be with you, Janet. You know, Matt, I want, I know many of my listeners have no idea, you know, what is Liberty Council, how you started. Can you just share a little bit about that before I start asking you questions? Sure. Anita and I, my wife, uh, she and I founded Liberty Council in 1989. She's also an attorney. She's president of Liberty Council. And our focus was religious freedom and the sanctity of human life. We eventually added the third prong, which is defense of God's design for marriage and sexuality in the early 1990s, when prior to the whole same-sex marriage issue, you had domestic disputes and dissolution of marriages, and you had custody issues, and one person would be involved in a same-sex lifestyle upon the divorce, and there were children issues that arose out of that. We began training people that did domestic law, and then eventually, including our, our third pillar, pillar, which is around 1993, 1994, that is the defense of God's design for marriage and human sexuality. So those are the three pillars, religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and God's design for marriage and human sexuality. Mm. Well, I tell you what, we most definitely need you out there, and I know a lot of the work that you're doing out there in the work is getting done, and I'm so proud to be your friend and be a part of what you're doing out there. You know, one of your employees, you know, sent me an email. Her name is Holly. Um, I was going to say, I'm not going to say her name. She said, you know, <laughs> you should do your research, you know, on some of the questions you want to ask, Matt. So here's my question. It's a long one. The T in LGBT has been mutilating children, but now some are pushing back against it. California is now a sanctuary state mm. for trans surgeries. Texas dad lost his right to stop his son from transitioning. What rights do parents have in the law to push back against the transitioning agenda? Well, they have a huge amount of opportunities and they need to exercise those. It's one of the biggest threats that we see right now to our children and the rights of parents. If you go back, for example, to the book After the Ball written in 1980, it was an agenda book. That talked about, at the time, gay and lesbian. You know, they switched the alphabet around to lesbian and gay. And then that particular book talks about the issue of transgender issues, mm -hmm. transsexuals, that you didn't want to roll that out until later on. Mm -hmm. Once the lesbian and gay or gay and lesbian became accepted in society, and you wanted to bring that out much, much later. What I think you're seeing happen is that has come out full force. And there's two different oppositions to it. One, there's an opposition by some that are within the uh, lesbian and gay community. But most particularly, there is an opposition that is happening because of the insidious nature that this is having with respect to our children, especially with the mutilating surgeries, the puberty blockers, cross hormone drugs, and then amputation of healthy body parts, uh, that kind of scenario is now having a reaction around the world, not just in the United States, but in mm -hmm. America, particularly. What we're seeing are families, mm -hmm. uh, moms and dads, that are completely unaware of what the schools are doing to their children by giving them false pronouns, mm -hmm. changing their names, and encouraging them to, quote, transition, that you can change your sex just like you can change your dress or your hairstyle mm -hmm. without the parents' knowledge. And when the parents later on become aware of it, they object, and the schools then start to increase the opposition to the parents. 
and even begin in some states to bring in child protective services because you're not giving what they believe is proper care to your children. So what we've seen is states like now California going to the extreme efforts of having a so-called sanctuary state for children who want to go through these hormones and puberty blockers and mutilating surgeries. On the other hand, you're seeing states like Florida with Governor Ron DeSantis and mm -hmm. the Florida Surgeon General, Dr. Latipo, mm -hmm. that are now pushing back against this, coming against uh, these companies and these uh, pharmaceutical organizations that are pushing these dangerous drugs and these life-altering surgeries. So that clash is continuing. I mm -hmm. think it's going to continue to crescendo. We're going to see more litigation regarding that. But parents need to be very, very in tune to what's happening to their children because a lot of this is going on without their knowledge. And when they detect something that's taking place mm -hmm. where the schools are trying to deceive these children to think that they can change their sex life, they can change their hair color, mm -hmm. they need to be involved and they need to seek appropriate legal action. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of parents don't know that they can go to the school and say, I want to know what books you have in the libraries. What are you teaching, you know, our children in the curriculum? If that is happening, when does a parent reach out to somebody like Liberty Council for help? What needs to happen with their child or in the school or in the workplace? I think they need to reach out very early in the process. And certainly they have a right to be able to know what's in the library. They have a right to know what their children are being taught, their curriculum. They have an opportunity to review the curriculum. Sometimes what we think is that the school board members are responsible for what's going on in the school. And to a large extent, that's true. Mm -hmm. But I have talked to Christian school board members, and in fact, two particular ones that started an organization now that is focused on schools, that when they were school board members and they were Christians, they were completely unaware of this LGBTQ agenda in their school mm -hmm. because it never reached the school board level. So if you just attend a school board meeting, you might be able to find out what's going on. But mm -hmm. there's also a good chance that you won't know that there is a teacher, that there is an administrator, that there is an unwritten policy or there's a practice that's taking place in your school mm -hmm. that's encouraging these LGBTQ clubs, that's encouraging or even having their own separate library apart from the school library with LGBTQ books and so forth. So they need to take a little bit more time to look into some of the policies and the practices of what's going on in their local schools. Mm -hmm. Do parents, you talked about this earlier, that if a child wants to transition or wants to live a homosexual life or wants to go to a school gay straight alliance group, and their parents say no, the first thing the school counselor wants to do is try to take away their parental rights, try to take their child out of the home. When I go to look at, you know, the Texas dad that lost his right to stop his son from transitioning, what else can we do? I mean, once, you know, they say, no, you can't do this, and it goes to the highest court, there's nothing else we can do. Is that correct? Well, no, I think you need to continue to pursue it. And just because there's one particular judge that goes the wrong way, there's appellate courts and there's finally, ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court or other higher courts that need to weigh in on this. But in addition to that, there's also the state legislature that needs to be presented with this information. I think that we need to be very bold and we see a lot more of this happening. I think you've seen more of this occur since COVID mm -hmm. when all the schools went virtual and parents began to realize the kind of curriculum that their children are seeing. And they then began to go to the school boards and push back on the masking and on the shutdown issues. And then they began to realize, you know, there's a whole nother universe out here with regards to terrible curriculum that they're teaching my child and other children. And they're starting to get involved. And I think that's a good sign that actually is one of the signs of moms, for example, and particularly moms, to a lesser extent, dads, but moms are rising up and they're reasserting their parental role with their children in their local public schools. And I think that's a good sign. They need to also not only be present at these school board meetings to show their support for their children and the opposition to this indoctrination, 
but they also need to take that to the state level as well. Mm -hmm. And they can do that by bringing stories, stories of individuals who have gone through these. Like, for example, Chloe is an example of someone who is a, quote, detransitioner, someone who went through some of the hormones and some of the surgical procedures, and then they regret that. There's a lot of people now that regret going through these various kinds of drug regimens and surgical procedures. And those individuals can be very strong voices at the local or statewide level. There's a lot of regret. I'm glad you said that. The, the funny thing about this is that while they're, you know, coming out of the closet, they want to put you and I in the closet, you know, meaning yeah. to, they want to silence us. And it's great for parents to right. hear what their rights are because a lot, many of them don't. And when you're talking about the transgender detransitioning, you know, just like Laura Perry Smaltz, who is now married, you know, mm -hmm. detransition, right. but a lot of people are detransitioning. They are walking away from that. They no longer want to be a boy when God made them a girl and vice versa. So I'm glad you're talking about that. Uh, this segues into something you just said. Um, why are legislators and those in government offices fighting for biblical marriage like they are for same-sex marriage? Well, that is a good question. You know, for example, uh, we just had this bill that came through the U.S. Congress with regards to same-sex marriage requiring one state to recognize another state's same-sex marriage law. And you didn't have a lot of strong opposition. For example, we in our Washington, D.C. office, we worked with the Senate side after it passed the House to try to stop it there. And the Republicans on the Senate side did not uh, do what they would call whip. They would not whip the vote. In other words, they took no leadership. The Republican leadership on the Senate side took no leadership to oppose it. They were just leaving that to individual people to make their own decisions. Uh, that the, the problem that they have here, you know, we, we have this strong support by some radical legislators for this LGBTQ agenda. And then there's a whole group of people that are on the other side of the issue, but they need to have a voice. They need to be strong. Mm -hmm. I think if they're not going to be strong, number one, they need to be voted out of office. But number two, while they're in office, we need to have stories. Like I know, for example, as I'm sitting here doing this interview, as we speak right now and throughout the next several days, uh, there are people in Washington, D.C. that are meeting with legislators, particularly with the new members of Congress, that are part of the changed movement. Mm -hmm. These are individuals who were involved in the same-sex lifestyle, or they were people who are detransitioners, and they're sharing their stories mm -hmm. with members of Congress. And I think mm -hmm. that storytelling is very powerful and needs to continue on a regular basis at the state level, mm -hmm. certainly. The local level, of course, and obviously at the national level as well. Yeah, I, I think that's awesome what, you know, the change movement is doing. I know they came to me and asked if I was able to come to Washington with them. I just wasn't able to at that time. However, I did go a few before COVID with another group and change was a part of that. But normally when you get in front of them, we never get in front of legislators. They they put, you know, a lot of their you know, college students or, you know, people that are just coming in for us to talk to them and then they deliver the message. We need to get in front of them, you know, and sit yeah, and talk yeah, about our issues. And I just don't know how that can be done because they will not talk with us. They're only going to push us to the side. Well, I know we have to keep on uh, pressing uh, and our office in Washington, D.C. is working with and will work with uh, individuals to try to open up those opportunities to be able to get in front of the right kind of legislators so that your story can be heard. It's very important that your story is heard, not just by staffers, but certainly by the member of Congress, uh, whether they're on the House side or the Senate side. It's important that your voice and your story be heard. I'm so glad you're saying that, Matt, because as many pastors and, and ministry leaders that I talk with, when we talk about this issue, I say, look, if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to have a platform and you're going to talk about this issue, you're going to be in the media, have somebody with you so they can share their story, because that's right. what's going to have the biggest impact. And that's, that's what the exactly gay community, right. sadly, say do, does so well. They share their stories and everybody's hearts just melt and it just pulls them right in. We got to get better at that. Matt, that's what, right. 
where do counseling ban bills stand across the country? Well, Liberty Council won the very first uh, court of appeals decision striking down a law that bans counselors from providing counsel to a client who wants to change unwanted same-sex attractions, behaviors, and gender identity. And that was at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. So that's binding on Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, Mm -hmm. But there are a number of states. uh, When you look at states, about half of the states have these laws. And then when you add up the local cities or counties that have it, it's about a total of 80 when you're looking at states, cities, and counties. So there's still a lot of these out there. We Mm -hmm. were hoping that the defendants in our case, which would be uh, Boca Raton, Florida, and Palm Beach County, Florida, would take the case to the Mm -hmm. U.S. Supreme Court. But they saw the handwriting on the wall that if they did that, they likely would lose. We want to take the case back to the Supreme Court to strike these laws down around the country. But here's my suggestion to counselors or clients. Do what you're called to do Mm -hmm. as a counselor. And if you run into any issue like this, contact Liberty Council because we're willing to take these cases on and challenge these laws to strike them down. They're clearly a violation of the First Amendment because what these laws do is they say that you can talk about the subject of human sexuality, but you can only do it from a pro-LGBT perspective. You can only encourage someone to go through the puberty blockers, the hormone, cross-sex drugs, and the surgical mutilating interventions. But you can't counsel them, even when they seek this counsel, to not go down that road. So it's only uh, one viewpoint that's allowed and another viewpoint that is banned, and that's clear violation of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Matt, thank you so much for for sharing that. I'm hoping that we got all that. We might have to blink that out, but that's okay. How is this making an impact on the cases Liberty Counselor has regarding Kim Davis and counselors? Well, I think it's a major impact on cases with regards to Kim Davis and counselors. And certainly one of the things that I believe will ultimately be the undoing of the 2015 Obergefell same-sex marriage opinion is the bill that was passed by Congress in 2022, the so-called same-sex marriage bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the biggest impediment to overturning the Burgerfell is not the law itself. It's unconstitutional. It's never had any constitutional foundation. Three of the justices that were in the 5-4 majority are no longer on the court. So there's been a sea change in the high court. Mm-hmm. The biggest impediment is what happens if you overturn it? What happens to the marriage laws or the marriage licenses more specifically that were already issued? Mm -hmm. Does it cause chaos with regards to property distribution and so forth? This particular law takes away that policy consideration. And so it allows the Supreme Court to just focus on the law itself, that it has no basis in the Constitution, like it did with regards to Roe versus Wade, and return the matter back to the states as opposed to making it a federal issue, Mm -hmm. and thus overturn the 2015 Obergefell decision. I think the Kim Davis case can be very instrumental, perhaps even the case that overturns the burger fell. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm talking with the founder and chairman of Liberty Council, Matt Staver. Matt, many people don't know about the Kim Davis case. Can you just mention a little bit about that? I hear I bring up Kim Davis, so they're probably going, who is Kim Davis? <laughs> yeah, Kim Davis was a clerk in Rowan County, Kentucky in 2015. She became a Christian a few years before this. And the Supreme Court issued its decision in June of 2015 regarding same-sex marriage. It was a surprising, stunning decision, 5-4. And Kentucky was one of the states that was part of that litigation. She asked to be accommodated based upon her religious beliefs so that her name, title, and authority would not appear on a marriage license that condoned marriage between two people of the same sex, which was contrary to biblical marriage. And she was rejected that request by the then governor, Bashir. Uh, There was a lawsuit that was ultimately filed. Kim Davis decided because of the uncertainty of what was happening in the law, and she didn't want to violate her religious beliefs, she stopped issuing all marriage licenses. And an individual, several individuals filed a lawsuit. They could have gone to any nearby clerk and gotten their marriage certificate. 
but they wanted Kim Davis's name on it because of her Christian views. We ended up ultimately winning the case at the substantive merits issue because there was a new governor that came in in 2015, Matt Bevan, who issued an executive order that would accommodate Kim Davis and her religious convictions. And then in April of 2016, the legislature unanimously passed a bill that accommodates not only Kim Davis, but all of the clerks who have religious objections to same-sex marriage. Look, you could opt out of issuing a marriage. Uh, you could opt out in Kentucky of issuing a hunting and fishing license if you had an objection to that. But you couldn't opt out of a same-sex marriage license until the governor was then seated in 2015, and then the legislature issued this legislation in 2016. But the case is still ongoing because the ACLU wants Kim Davis now to pay personally for attorney's fees and damages for this short period of time that these individuals on their own refuse to get a marriage certificate from another clerk. So the case is still ongoing. It's a case that could go back to the United States Supreme Court. In fact, it has a high probability of going back to the Supreme Court. And the argument will be that her religious freedom was violated and that the 2015 Obergefell decision should be overturned. I think this case could be the one to do it. I believe that she'll win if if it does go that high. You know, she has what my good friend Michelle Bachman says, a titanium spine. (laughs) (laughs) Because you need one to fight this war. Hey, my last question for you, Matt, before, you know, my listeners get the information on how to reach out to you or how to reach out to your office. What will Respect for Marriage Act mean for churches, counselors, schools, colleges and nonprofits? Well, I think it is a very narrow religious exception that is in that particular bill with regards to perhaps churches that teach the Bible respecting tax exemption. That's a narrow protection. But nonprofits in general are not protected because nonprofits in general uh, don't fall within this very narrow protection. The legislation itself provides this very limited protection to only nonprofit organizations whose primary purpose is the teaching of the Bible and religious doctrine. Uh, That may cover a small number, but it's not going to cover most. And it's not going to help any for-profit organization like Hobby Lobby or the baker or the flower maker. They're Mm -hmm. not going to be protected uh, by that particular narrow exception. That should doom the law, but unfortunately, it continued to pass anyway. I think this particular bill will ultimately be challenged based on religious freedom issues as it ultimately is rolled out into the future and is enforced on individuals. It ultimately needs to be repealed. I think it will ultimately be the undoing of the same-sex marriage decision, uh, but I think it also will be something that we'll have to litigate in the meantime. Yeah. If you're listening to this podcast and you have a friend or a family member or, you know, a school teacher that's dealing with this type of issue in school because they're standing up for righteousness, right, standing with God and they're about to, you know, lose their job or they want to transition your child uh, without your consent. Liberty Council is the place to reach out to. Matt, if somebody wants to reach out to you, where would they go? Do you have a phone number that they can call? Yes, the easy way to do that is go to our website, lc.org, just two letters, LC, like in Liberty Council, lc.org. And they can also call directly 407-875-1776. That's 407-875-1776 or lc.org. Matt, thank you so much for taking time to to be on Healing and Made for You with Janet Boynes. You know, I love you. I consider you a friend and, and God bless you. And thanks again. Thank you, Janet. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for listening to Healing and Made Free with Janet Boynes. Acts 1034 says, God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't play favorites, which means what he has done for Janet, what he has done for guests on this show, he will do for you too. If you are struggling with anything, do not hesitate to reach out to Janet Boynes Ministries. They will do their best to help you any way they can. Go to the website, JanetBoynesMinistries.com. Janet loves you, and most importantly, God loves you. Have a blessed day.